Hello everyone, uh, my name is Arusha and I will be giving, me and Jenna together, we're going to be giving you guys a blood revision, okay, and uh, brought, you by, brought to you by Pacademia, okay. So uh, first of all, I believe you guys have gone over the blood chapter, right? Yes. Okay, one thing to mention is that we won't be covering all of the blood notes, I will try to incorporate them here and there, but it's not really that possible for us to go over the blood notes as well as this, because it's going to take us time, uh, but however, the blood notes are super, super, super important please don't skip them we had questions from them in the final and as we go along of course i'm going to tell you guys what's important and what like you need to really focus on and i have included like things that are important because i feel like the chapter is kind of dense but it's a cute chapter it's a really cute chapter okay and let's move from here yeah, really or maybe try from the keyboard um, let me try because it's from the it's not connected to any laptop right because there's the pen, um, the, the top corner, click on the top corner. Yeah, just close that. Okay. Just See? Yeah. Okay. Can you try that? Oh, it's not, it's, it's working. Yeah, it's working. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Okay, first thing is the functions of blood. Okay, it might seem so simple, but uh, I remember last uh, last year we had a TBL question, right? We had a TBL question who all of the options were functions of blood. They were just trying to confuse us and ask us which particular function of blood are they referring to, okay? And this is like an easy concept, but just focus, okay? Okay, let's start with transport. What does blood do? Transport stuff, right? Okay, what can it transport? Just an example. Oxygen. Oxygen. Does it transport hormones? Yes. yes, it transports different things, right? So blood is the medium and it transports stuff. This is the first thing, okay? Now, um, it will take them to their target organs. Of course, it also does the gas exchange, like it takes their blood, right? Okay, next thing, regulation. What does it regulate? The? pH. Okay, the pH, that's one thing. Another thing? Temperature. temperature, body temperature, perfect, okay? And another thing it does is it maintains the fluid volume in what? In the circulatory system, right? Blood is going to be part of what? Circulatory system. So it's gonna maintain the fluid or uh, even the blood volume, right? Okay, now, um, does anyone know what's the pH of blood itself? So, so we can term it as, perfect. So we can term it as? Slightly alkaline, exactly. Okay, now protection. So blood, of course, is gonna protect us, right? So it would do what? It would prevent blood loss. In what cases? For example, it has what circulating inside it? Platelets. Platelets. So these things are there for? Protection. Exactly, for the sake of protection, right? So if they, got, if they got a question, which of the following is the functions of blood related to protection, you would go for something related to platelets most probably. You wouldn't go for, oh, it transports hormones. Yes, it does transport hormones, but we want to go for something that makes more sense, okay? Next thing, prevent infection. Of course, again, it has different, uh, different things inside it, uh, transports, and it prevents the infection, okay? Okay, now let's just go over the blood characteristics. First of all, blood itself, it's a sticky mixture, right? And it's going to be what? It's gonna be thick, it's opaque as well. When you look at blood, you see, you see it as opaque, right? What, everyone knows what opaque means? Okay, can't see through it. And it has a metallic taste. Not that we all tasted blood, but it has a metallic taste. Just know the basic characteristics of blood, okay? And the blood color. Now, the color varies depending on what? The amount of oxygen. So we have two types of colors. This is just a basic um, way to say it. One is going to be scarlet red, and one is gonna be dark red. Which one's oxygenated? Scarlet, scarlet red, okay? And then uh, we already mentioned that the pH is going to be slightly alkaline. Okay, super, super, super important slide. Know this by heart, understand this. Okay, let's go over it. So this, when you centrifuge blood, you're gonna get it like this, right? So you take a sample, you centrifuge it, this is how it appears. Why do you think plasma is on top and I have um, erythrocytes, for example, at the bottom? Depending on the density, right? So plasma is on the top because it's less dense. Now what percentage does plasma form? Here, percentages are actually important, so don't ignore them. Okay, usually we ignore numbers, but here they are important. Okay, 55% of this is going to be plasma, right? And it's the least dense. Now, at the bottom, the dense component. It's called formed elements. Together, we term it formed elements. What does it consist of? It consists of two things. 
in the middle between the plasma and the um, between the uh, form between the erythrocytes, we're gonna have a thin coating. This is called a Buffy coat. What does Buffy coat consist of? <laughs> exactly, leukocytes and platelets. Am I going too fast, guys? <laughs> Fine. Okay. So leukocytes and platelets, which is going to be roughly less than one percent. Okay. Then we have what we have the erythrocytes. Erythrocytes are going to form what percentage? Forty-five percent. That's a generalized value that we're going to memorize. Plus, uh, of course, it varies from. Male to female, so maybe I guess male is 47%, not really important, okay, but females is a bit less, okay? We're gonna, uh, I think I have it in the slides as to why, but it's, it has something to do with the hormones, okay? Okay, now erythrocyte value. The percentage of erythrocytes in the blood is called? Hematocrit. hematocrit. Remember this, okay, hematocrit is important. Like 80%, they're gonna test you on hematocrit, okay? Okay, and it's the most dense component. Okay, now this is formed elements. 45% of it all is the formed elements. Really? Oh, okay. Okay, next thing we have is plasma in the blood, right? So plasma is going to be what? It's going to be straw colored. When you looked at, oh, when, when you saw it before this, did you see it was like yellowish, right? Whereas the erythrocytes were red. So it's going to be, we call this straw colored. And it's sticky, okay? All right, so now plasma. Plasma is again made of different things. 90% of plasma is going to be water, water right? Water is the, the, it forms 90%. It's a really, really important component of plasma. Okay, now, I have different dissolved solutes. Can someone just give me anything? Oxygen. Yes, exactly, and nitrogenous substances, different things, right? So electrolytes, we're gonna go over it now. So we have water, solutes, and non-protein nitrogenous substances. I'm going to go over solutes as I feel like that's really, really important. They're going to test you on this. Just know that water forms 90% of it. And what's the function of water here? Solvent. Solvent. Solvent, exactly. Okay. And as for the non-protein nitrogenous substances, it's not that important. Give it a read. I don't mean they're not going to test you. Like, I don't know, but it's not that important. Okay. So it's just going to be what? Can someone give me any example? Exactly, so these are going to form the non-protein nitrogenous components. What's really important here to focus on is the solutes in blood, okay? Okay, let's see. Okay, now, first part of solute. Solutes is composed of two things, one of them being electrolytes, one of them being plasma proteins. Plasma proteins, super, super, super important. Let's go over it. What percentage is plasma proteins? 8%. They're not going to really bring a question in, oh, what percentage is plasma proteins? No. But how can they test you? Okay. Plasma protein seems less by percentage, but it's high by weight. weight. Okay. Remember this. So plasma proteins is high by weight, but by percentage, it's not. Okay. Now, overall, what's the function of plasma proteins? Osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure. Exactly. And it's going to be uh, maintaining the water balance, right? We'll go over this now, and other functions would be tri uh, transport, and then it's a protein, so enzymatic functions, right? Okay, we have three types of plasma proteins. Number one is going to be albumin. 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 Super, super important. Like 100% you're gonna get a question on this. If not in the blood quiz, in the midterm. If not in the midterm, in the final. They love albumin. It's one of the things that they love testing you on, okay? Now, albumin is going to be the major component of uh, proteins. So it forms? 60%. You don't really have to know the percentage that high, but I remember um, going through... Um, okay, so uh, they did uh, have a match, up, uh, match the following from what I remember uh, last uh, semester, last year, right? And uh, the, the option was 60%, formed 60% of the proteins or something. And then the uh, other thing over here, you could find albumin, so you have to match them together. You guys know you're going to have matching questions, right? In bio two. So try to... It's not only a suit? No, there will be matching questions. But trust me, they're easy. Just try to practice and incorporate this in your practice. Like, if you do them for the first time on, like, on the day, it's going to be confusing, okay? There are questions? Okay, yes. Are there any writing questions? No, no, no. No writing questions, okay? Except for ChemLab. But Bio, no. And even Chem2, there are no writing questions. Okay, where is albumin produced? Liver. Liver. What's the major function of albumin? 
Osmotic pressure. You see a question that says osmotic pressure, you go straight to albumin. However, other proteins, as well as other things in blood, do contribute to osmotic pressure. So you don't just go straight to albumin. If you see it mentioned alone, that's when you go straight to albumin. If we have other things mentioned with it, then you're going to look at other things as well. Do you get my point? But usually when we think of osmotic pressure, we think of albumin. Everyone here knows what's osmotic pressure, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, globulins. Globulins are going to form 36%. Now, what, what type of globulins do I have? Alpha and beta and then gamma. What's the major difference between the two? Where they're produced, exactly. Where are alpha and beta produced? Liver. Is gamma produced in the liver? No. no. Uh, yes, exactly, perfect. Okay, alpha and beta are produced by the liver. What are they? Transport. Transport proteins. From the protein chapter, you know that we have different types of proteins. This is a perfect example of transport proteins. What do they transport? Different things, for example, lipids, metal ions, etc. Let's see uh, gamma. Okay, gamma is going to be a major component of the immunity part. All right, so it is going to form, and, uh, the antibodies are released and it's going to be helping in the immune response. And it's not produced by the liver. liver. Okay, now fibrinogen, it's the least component of all the proteins. It's going to form 4%, okay? Fibrinogen is used where? Blood clotting, exactly. Okay, so now you know the major function of each protein. Albumin? Osmotic pressure. Okay, alpha and beta? Transport. And uh, gamma? Perfect. And fibrinogen? Blood clotting. Okay, so like we said, solutes are composed of what? Proteins and? Electrolytes. Electrolytes, again, important aspect. They might test you on this. What's the major thing to know over here? That electrolytes are the most abundant in? Number. Proteins were? Weight. Weight. Okay. And electrolytes, what do you have? You have anion. Do you have cations? Okay. Let's just go over some examples. For example, cations. Are they positive or <coughs> negative? Positive. T for positive, right? Anions and for negative. Okay. What's an example of an anion? Chloride. See a negative, right? And positive uh, cations? Sodium. Sodium. Potassium, right? So we have so many examples. Now, the basic uh, takeaway for you here is going to be that electrolytes are the most abundant. What do we have? We have anions and cations circulating in the blood. What's the function? This is the key part for you to know over here. What is the function of the electrolytes in the blood? Like, why do we have them? Plus the pH. Plus the pH. If a question comes, what, um, for example, if a question comes and it just men mentions osmotic pressure, what would you go for? Albumin. Albumin. If it mentions osmotic pressure and the blood pH, you're going to go for electrolytes. Because we know that they're positively and negatively charged, so they would contribute to the pH and it would also contribute to osmotic pressure. Clear up until now? Am I going too fast, guys? No. Okay. I think it just doesn't like me, okay. Formed elements. Now, for the formed elements, you guys remember we, we went over the centrifuge sample? Right, and we said that foreign elements consist of what percentage? 45%. 45 percentage. Now, what are they made of? Erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. Let's go over the basic, basic functions, and then we're going to go over each one of them separately. Okay, so I'll be covering erythrocytes, and my friend Jenna will cover leukocytes and platelets for you guys. Okay, erythrocytes. Erythrocytes, what's the special thing about erythrocytes? Mm -hmm. No nucleus. Does it have organelles though? No. no organelles. Okay then, um, it doesn't have organelles. So does it, like when, when it does uh, the, does it do anaerobic or does it do aerobic metabolism? Uh, anaerobic. anaerobic metabolism. We're gonna see why I mentioned this, okay? Okay, platelets, what are platelets? Cell fragments, when you look at them, when you look at the shape, you see that it's like irregular, right? So you know that they are cell fragments. We'll cover them in more depth. And which one of the following is actually a real cell? Leukocytes. Leukocytes. They have everything that a cell should have. Now, most of them are going to survive just a few days. Like, for example, erythrocytes, they are just going to survive for 120 days, I believe. Something like this, okay? And most cells are not going to divide, so they come from what? Stem, cell stem cells. cells. What's the name of the specific stem cell? Hemoglobin. Yes. Where is it located? Uh, red, bone marrow. red bone marrow. Exactly. You move the pen? 
So now let's go over erythrocytes. Another name for erythrocytes is? Red blood cells. Red blood okay. Are they small or when, I mean, have you guys seen them? Like in the lab? I've seen them. No? Erythrocytes? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah, right? Are they big or are they small? Uh, no, they're, they're kind of like, I wouldn't say big or small, but like I would say it's like. Yeah. So what, what do you guys describe the shape as? Biconcave disc, right? Okay, they're biconcave discs. Now. Um, okay, I want to mention this part, especially important. What maintains the shape of erythrocytes? Are they just hard <laughs> cells that like they never bend? Mm -hmm. No. What, they, why do they bend? Why do they bend? To pass through capillaries. To pass through capillaries. Sometimes they have to go and they have to insert themselves here. Would they go if they were stiff? No. No. But how do they bend? Do they just like do they have a brain? No. So like how do they bend? They have spectrum inside them. All right. So if they bought a question, for example. And this is just an example at the back of my head, so don't come at me if it's not a real clinical scenario. Okay, for example, a person, um, his blood, for example, stopped or something, and the issue was found to be that his erythrocytes are not passing through the capillaries well. What do you, as a doctor, think the issue is with? Spectrum, spectrum right? So the issue would be with spectrum and a couple of other proteins that are going to maintain the biconcave shape by attaching to the plasma membrane of what? Red blood cells, right? Okay, now the spectral net is going to be deformable, so again, it allows them to twist, turn, assume different shapes when they're entering through different spaces. Okay, what else here? I don't think it's really that important. Um, we mentioned that they are a nucleate. That's a really, really key feature that you should know. Okay, now we discussed they are, what's the shape? Biconcave. Now we had a question regarding the uh, the question went something like, oh, uh, why are erythrocytes a perfect example of complementarity of shape and function? We'll see now, but um, just don't skip over this part, okay? Okay, so now, they are, it's, as it mentioned, it's a perfect example of the complementarity of function and structure. Can someone tell me, like, from what you guys think, why would we consider them perfect? High surface area, exactly. Another thing, remember when I mentioned that the erythrocytes, do they have mitochondria? No. no. So what do they do? But they do still generate energy, right? Yeah. How do they do it? Anaerobic. Anaerobic mechanisms. What's the purpose behind this? To the oxygen they carry. Exactly. Doesn't this indicate that they're a perfect example? It does, right? So this was one of the options, I believe. It was something along the lines of this, okay? So they don't use up the oxygen that they want to transport, and that actually makes them very efficient. Okay, again. Erythrocytes are going to be 97% what? Hemoglobin. Do you have a question? No. Oh, okay. They're going to be 97% hemoglobin and they transport what exactly? The major, major thing that they transport. Oh, oh. Yes, respiratory gases. Okay, again, the small size and uh, as your friend mentioned, they have a large surface area that actually contributes to their function and they're disc shaped. So the gas exchange is uh, better in this way because there's Basically, um, it's just a small point, but there's no point that's far from the surface. So it actually allows for good gas exchange. Okay, so the way that they're built is amazing. Okay, hemoglobin. You guys took this in biochem, right? Mm -hmm. Can someone tell me what's it made up of? Okay, okay, let's divide it from the beginning. Hemoglobin. So one part is gonna be the? Heme. The other part is going to be that? Hemoglobin. Which is the protein part? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Exactly. Now, what, co what, what gives them the pigment? Hemoglobin. Heme. Right. So what's heme? It's iron. iron. Exactly. Which part binds to the oxygen? Iron. Iron part. Exactly. Okay. So the globin part is going to be made up of how many polypeptides? Four. Four. Two of them being? Alpha. Alpha. And two of them being? Beta. Beta. Okay, this is what HbA is made up of. What's HbA? Adult hemoglobin. Mm -hmm. Two alpha, two beta, two. right? And in thalassemia, we know that sometimes their uh, issue occurs with this part. We'll go over it now. Okay, now free hemoglobin is if it's high. Let's say a person has high amount of hemoglobin. What does it contribute to? High blood viscosity. Do you guys know what viscosity means? Exactly, it's, it's thick. Right? 
Okay. Now, um, okay. Uh, this was a question that I think Al Adel mentioned in class, or it was part of the TBX something, but let's go over it. How many oxygens does each hemoglobin transport? Four. 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 Why? Four, four, four irons. Four irons, and each iron binds to one oxygen. Okay, now we have types of hemoglobin. So we said that the color of blood is coming from? Heme. Heme. And we said that it is going to vary according to? The amount of oxygen. So I have three types of hemoglobin. I have, first of all, oxyhemoglobin, deoxyhemoglobin, third one being? Carb carb amino hemoglobin. Oxyhemoglobin, okay, I'm just gonna go like an overview, but the major point I've mentioned is that you need to know that why are there variations in the color and what each one is going to be for. Oxyhemoglobin, what's the, the, the way that it transports? Like, what's the route of transport? From the lungs to the tissues. From the lungs to the tissues. So it means it goes from the lungs to the tissues. That's why it's red, because it's oxygenated. oxygenated. For deoxyhemoglobin, why is it like, why is it deoxy? Because it gave the oxygen to the tissues. So the, the way that this goes is it releases the oxygen from the blood to the tissues. So what's the root for this? Tissue to lung, uh, lung. Yes, lung to tissue. Okay, and this one is going to be? Tissue. Blood to tissue. Because it gave off the oxygen, so now it's going to be deoxy. As for carb amino hemoglobin, what happens over here is that carbon dioxide, okay, um, is going to combine with hemoglobin. What portion of hemoglobin does it combine with? Globin. 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 Not the heme. And when it combines, we form, uh, so it combines to amino acids, and that's why it's called carb amino hemoglobin. You guys get this? Any confusion? Yes. Does uh, carbon dioxide affect the color of the red blood cell? It will, uh, it will, it will be more like, um, when you look at it, it's not gonna be, it's, it's not gonna have the red color. It's gonna be like less, more pale. Okay, but so each color depends on the amount of oxygen in it. So like deoxy, it's going to be dark red. Dark red. Okay. This part, erythropoiesis, not super, super important. The book does mention a lot of details regarding this. It's like, I think it's a page itself, right? But let's just go over the basic concepts and let's see if it makes sense. Okay, what do we start with? Hematopoietic stem cell, remember this name, okay? Hematopoietic stem cell. It's a stem cell, right? So it's the progenitor cell. Like it's the one that gives rise to this. Okay. By the way, we call the process of forming um, erythrocytes erythropoiesis. Okay. Hematopoiesis is something else. So just refer to it as erythropoiesis. Okay. Now, what do, what do we form after this? Myeloid stem cell is in the middle, and then we form a pro-erythroblast. Uh, pro, uh, pro Okay, and then it continuously divides, 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 and there is ribosome synthesis. When there is ribosome synthesis, we call it basophilic. We call it basophilic because when you stain it, you're gonna see that it's going to be this way. So this is why it's named this way, basophilic erythroblast. At this point, the cell division ceases or stops, okay? Then we're gonna have phase two, which is hemoglobin synthesis, right guys? Okay, in this case, what do we have? We have a poly, Chromatic erythroblast. Okay. After that, uh, basically at this point, hemoglobin is synthesizing, so we're going to call it polychromatic. At the next point, we're going to call it orthochromatic. Orthochromatic. All of the HB has now accumulated. It's been synthesized, right? And now the nucleus and organelles are going to start to leave. Is it making sense, guys? Yes. Yes. Okay. Read over what the book says. Again, just keep it as a basic concept. Okay. Do not focus focus on details. But read over it, do not skip anything, ever. Okay, all of the HP has accumulated. What's the next step? See, we said that nucleus and organelles, they're still there, they're leaving. Why are they leaving? Because we said erythrocytes are? Annucleates. Annucleates, and they don't have organelles. So when it's trying to leave, what do we call it? We call it a reticulocyte, right? So reticulum of ribosomes now accumulates, okay? And what's the next part when it enters the blood, uh, blood capillary? We call it a? Erythrocyte. Erythrocyte, simple, right? So know the names and just know what's happening at each stage. Does this make sense to you guys? Should I go over anything? No, make sense? Okay. Okay, another important thing, reticulocyte count. 
A reticulocyte count is a rough breed of the formation of red blood cells. Okay, know the definition. And if it's high, what, what would you think? A lot of red blood cells, though, would be the opposite. Okay, erythropoiesis regulation. Our body, what happens when it's out of oxygen? What would it sense? It would be like, oh, I'm out of oxygen. What do you do to, to restore the oxygen capacity? More red blood cells. More red blood cells, right? So in this case, if, for example, the oxygen is low, so you're going to increase the production of RBCs. Low erythrocytes are going to be tissue hypoxia. Everyone knows the meaning of hypoxia, right? If you have high red blood cells, high viscosity, right? Okay. Now, um, our body, of course, is going to ensure homeostasis at all times. Okay, tissue hypoxia factor. What happens? We have kidney cells when they're hypoxic, which means that they're not receiving enough oxygen. What are they going to do? They're going to, um, basically, the oxygen sensing enzymes, they're not going to be able to degrade the, they're going to start degrading, sorry, they're going to start degrading an intracellular signaling molecule. What's the name of this? Tissue hypoxic factor. Okay? Uh, tissue inducible factor. Make sense, guys? Yeah. Tissue inducible factor. What's the purpose of this tissue inducible factor? As it accumulates or as it increases, it's going to increase what the synthesis and release of something so, so important, known as erythropoietin. We're going to go over erythropoietin. Again, it's a major, major topic. They're going to definitely test you on erythropoietin either now or later, but they're going to test you. Okay, uh, hypoxia inducible factor, they didn't really test us on it, but just know that it's what will cause. So if as it accumulates, it will accumulate the synthesis and release of erythropoietin. Make sense, guys? Everything here makes sense? Okay, let's move on. Erythropoietin. Again, our body is going to experience what? A drop in oxygen. This drop in oxygen can be due to different cases. Let's discuss one of them, for example. Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage would be? Blood loss, excessive blood loss. So that could be one of the cases. What could be another another scenario? Iron deficiency. Yes, iron deficiency. So you have insufficient uh, hemoglobin. Another thing, low oxygen available. What about the people who live at higher altitudes? Do they have enough oxygen? No. no. And maybe a person has pneumonia. In this case, what comes to the rescue? Erythropoietin. Where is erythropoietin formed? In the kidneys. Perfect. Erythropoietin comes from the kidneys. So, high, okay, we said that low oxygen equals to high EPO, erythropoietin production. Okay, if I have high oxygen, low erythropoietin production, right? It would depress it. And erythropoiesis, what's erythropoiesis controlled by? Is it controlled by the number of RBCs that we have in our body? No. No, what is it controlled by? Oxygen carrying capacity. This is a really important concept to understand. Okay, so it's controlled by the Oxygen carrying capacity. Okay. You need to be aggressive. I can tell. Okay. Let's just summarize it really quick. Really quick. Okay. What would be the stimulus? I want you guys to tell me. Hypoxia. Hypoxia. So they could bring a matching question, though it didn't come before, but like they could bring a matching question where it says stimulus and maybe like, for example, the effects, right? And you would match the stimulus with hypoxia. Okay. Now we already went over what could cause this hypoxia. Kidney starts producing what? Erythropoietin. Who does erythropoietin act on or where does it go? Red bone marrow. Red bone marrow, Red bone marrow is going to? make red blood cells and that will then restore the oxygen carrying capacity so this is how homeostasis is going to be maintained and it's my negative feedback okay so far any questions no okay okay athletes abuse EPO did you guys ever hear of this before really okay can someone tell me why would they do this because so they can have uh, more stamina more stamina more endurance which athletes commonly would do this Marathon. Marathon runners, those that need a high amount of energy for a longer period of time, marathon runners, swimmers, etc. What they do is they're going to abuse EPO. Now, what they do, they inject EPO inside. Now, when they inject EPO, what happens? Increase, increase in the red blood cell production. This would increase the viscosity. viscosity. But before that, it their purpose is oxygen, right? 
that then increases stamina. Now, what's the side effect? Increase in viscosity. Why is it not good? Why is increased viscosity bad? Exactly, blood strokes, heart failure, all of this could happen. So it's not recommended, right? And it's going to make the blood so sticky and sludgy that it could actually, it could, you know, it could get stuck. Many bad things can happen, right? So it's not recommended at all. It actually makes the hematocrit go from 45% to 65%. Okay, again, it's, uh, let's go over this uh, picture. It's very generalized. So, low oxygen. One last time. Low oxygen equals to? High erythropoietin by the? Kidney. kidney. Perfect. Okay, then that goes to the red bone marrow that produces erythrocytes. Erythrocytes run through the blood. Now, erythrocytes. Did we say they have a long lifespan or a short lifespan? Short. 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 About? 120 days. Okay. Now, what happens to old erythros uh, erythrocytes? Aged or old or damaged? They become stiff. They become stiff. Then what do we what do we do with them? Do we let them be? You break them down. When you break down the erythrocytes, you're basically going to break down the hemoglobin. What does it break down into? The two things it's formed of, heme and globin. Globin is what? Proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. So this would be what? Reabsorbed. Because it's a good thing. Is it a bad thing? No. The body needs it, right? So the amino acids are going to be reabsorbed. What about the heme portion? First of all, iron. Iron is good? Yes. Iron is good, right? So it's going to basically be stored as? Ferritin. or? Hemocytin. Remember the names, guys. Ferritin or? Hemocytin. Good. Iron will then be bound to what? What's that specific thing? Transferrin. Transferrin. And it's going to be released from the liver for? Erythropoiesis. Okay, so guys, what did we mention? It's stored as? Hemocytin or? Ferritin. What does it bind to? Transferrin. Okay. What about the bilirubin portion of heme? Bilirubin is going to be? Bilirubin is going to be degraded, right? Okay, so it will be picked up by the liver and it is secreted where? In the bile. In the bile. Where is bile? Intestine. Intestine, okay. And where it is metabolized to what two basic, two major things? Stereocobulin and? Urobilin. And I think the book does mention something else as well. It's, sorry again? Yeah, yes, know this name as well, okay guys? It's important. Okay, now, for the stercoblin, which portion is it? It's the part that's going to be degraded in feces. It's gonna be removed, okay? Now, for the raw materials by the intestine, they're gonna be picked up as they could be used for uh, other important purposes, okay? Like food, nutrients, and uh, vitamin B12, for example, and etc. Any questions, guys? What was the other name? Uh, it was... What was the other name? It was something with... It's a really weird name, but guys know it, okay? It is mentioned in the book. I'll tell you after the... after finishing. Okay, I'm not sure why the pictures are not appearing, but you guys tell me, what's anemia? Low oxygen carrying capacity. Sorry? Low oxygen. Low oxygen, exactly. What could this be due to? Three major causes. Can someone tell me one? Destruction of red blood cells. Okay, destruction of red blood cells. What could be another cause? High altitude. High altitude. Okay. High altitude is going to be, uh, we'll see it later on. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so one of them is going to be blood loss. What's another thing? Not enough RBCs are produced. What's another thing? They're going to be destroyed faster than they are produced. So the rate is going to be fast. Okay? Isn't that also destruction of red blood cells? Sorry? Wouldn't that count also as a destruction of red blood cells? That is the destruction of red blood cells. Okay, so, so we have increased blood, blood loss, yes, destruction blood. of red blood cells, and? Uh, what was the other thing? Okay, increased blood loss would be hemorrhage. hemorrhage. First thing done. Second thing, not enough of them are produced. We're going to now go over the details. Okay. And then the third thing is that they're being destroyed too fast. Yes. Get it? Everyone gets the three major causes? Yes. Hemorrhage or excessive blood loss? not enough being produced, or they're going to be destroyed really fast, okay? Okay, so guys, here are the three causes which we discussed, blood loss and 
We mentioned them, okay. Okay, first cause, blood loss. Hemorrhage, what two types do I have? Chronic and acute. By the way, guys, I had mentioned in class that last year, chronic hemorrhagic anemia is kind of similar to iron deficiency anemia. Okay? Okay. Now, uh, hemorrhagic anemia, the cause is so simple, it's blood loss, right? So acute hemorrhagic anemia. Which one requires immediate attention? Acute. acute. What would be the treatment for acute? Transfusion. Blood transfusion. Why? Because what could be a cause? Anything. Someone can stab, stab one, for example, right? Okay, what about chronic hemorrhagic anemia? What could be a cause? Ulcers. Yes, ulcers, right? So, hemorrhoids? Yes, hemorrhoids is a cause. So, in this case, What's your major concern? You want to? Treat the main cause. Treat the main cause, right? You want to treat the main cause, and that treatment will be then able to restore the, uh, the blood that's lost and the oxygen capacity. Okay, are you guys understanding so far? Yes. Any difficulty in this part? No. Anemias is so, so, so important. Yes? Could you give me an example of another chronic anemia? Another so cause of chronic deficiency, for example, that can Okay, so what was mentioned, basically, why was this point brought up, okay? Basically, there was a question regarding hemorrhoids and excessive blood loss. In that case, um, the, the, the erythrocytes were mentioned to be pale and microcytic. This would be? Iron, Iron deficient. But we know that hemorrhoids could also be a cause of chronic, uh, chronic, anemia, uh, chronic hemorrhagic anemia. So they're kind of interrelated. When you see the real medicine, we don't really specify it by a set criteria, like, oh, no, it's chronic hemorrhagic anemia. Right? So they can be interchangeably used. Does that make a bit of sense? Yeah, I think yeah, yeah. Get it? So okay. Yeah, somewhat. Uh, somewhat. Somewhat. Uh, most of it is kind of confusing, especially if you guys did the TBI questions. They make them confusing on purpose just to generate discussion. Yes? Uh, I asked my doctor about chronic hemorrhagic anemia and uh, iron, iron deficiency. And he said that chronic hemorrhagic anemia leads at the end to the to the iron deficiency, deficiency yes. anemia and and usually when we just say hemorrhagic anemia we don't specify it's acute or chronic exactly. we just say hemorrhagic anemia we are going to we acute. Mean the acute anemia. exactly okay uh, the question also was there was a question in the tbn and it was like what's the cause so the cause uh, it leads to iron deficiency but the cause is going to be hemorrhagic anemia okay it's just a weird concept okay so far, so clear? Yes. yes. Can uh, thrombocytopenia also be a cause for chronic hemorrhage? Thrombocytopenia. Yeah, I think it could be. But again, uh, it's a clinical aspect, so I'm not 100% sure. Okay. I think I asked this question. I don't know Continue. Okay, perfect. Okay, guys, anemia chapter is, uh, anemia part of the chapter is so, 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 so important. All the disorders, glucoside disorders, and the blood disorders, and anemia. 100, actually 1,000% 1, they're gonna test you on this. It's what the major chapter is composed of, right? So go over every single point. Don't skip any sentence, okay? Okay, guys. The first cause, not enough RBCs are produced. produced. This can give me four, uh, four types of anemia. The first one. Iron deficiency. Iron deficiency, from the name itself, what do you guys expect? Iron. Deficiency of iron, right? This could be either because of the person not being able to take or the person is not taking adequate amounts of iron. That's one thing. Another thing could be because of impaired iron absorption, vitamin right? B12. Sorry? Is it because of the vitamin? It could be. I'm not really sure about this, con uh, this point. Okay? Uh, for the vitamin B12, uh, we'll come to it. Impaired vitamin B12 is also something. Okay? Now, uh, it could, again, what did we mention? It could be a result of chronic hemorrhagic anemia. Okay, now, how would the erythrocytes, if you viewed them, compared to normal erythrocytes, how would they appear? Smaller. Okay. Smaller, so we call it? Microcytic. Microcytic. And? Pale. pale. Right? Okay, now, why would they appear pale, by the way, guys? Because the iron has to bind to them. Iron has to bind to the oxygen, but there's no oxygen to bind to because the iron is bad, so there's yes. no cover, it's pale. Exactly, okay. Now, it cannot synthesize enough of the complement at B. Okay, what would be the treatment? Simple. Uh, iron iron deficiency, so? Iron. Iron. iron, right? Okay, pernicious anemia. 
What's pernicious anemia? By the way, guys, they love pernicious anemia. Autoimmune disease. Yes, it's an autoimmune disease. What does the body do? Why is it called autoimmune? It destroys what? The stomach mucosa. mucosa. Yes, stomach mucosa. What does, okay, it destroys the stomach mucosa. What does it have to do with anemia? <laughs> yes, stomach mucosa produces something called intrinsic factor. That intrinsic factor is super important for absorption of vitamin B12 catalyst, yes. Okay, so in this case, how would you see the, uh, the erythrocytes? Macrocytic. Okay, you're going to see them as bigger. Here, you're going to see them as smaller and paler. Here, you're going to see them as bigger. Guys, remember, so you have to look at when they mention the shape of the RBC, the color of the RBC. You also have to look at what important characteristic does this anemia have that differentiates it from something else. So, pernicious anemia, what's the very important thing that's missing? B12. Vitamin B12 because of? Intrinsic factor. Okay. They love, love, love testing on pernicious anemia. Okay. Mostly, mostly the clue is going to be anything to do with the stomach part. Right? Okay. Now, what would be the treatment for pernicious anemia? Um, Vitamin B12 injection. Or you can do what? You can give a um, nasal uh, yeah. vitamin B12 gel. Okay. Now, uh, the lack of vitamin B12 could be due to different things. It could even be due to the person not being, uh, not eating enough meats. So another clue that they give you is that, oh, the person is vegetarian. So either it's to do with the stomach or to do with the vegetarian person. Renal anemia. In renal anemia, what's low? Just now we said that kidney produces, renal means kidney, right? So kidney produces? EPO. So in this case, what would be low? EPO with B low. So because of lack of EPO, what's affected? What's the process? Uh, erythropoiesis. Yeah, erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis, okay? Now, that would accompany a renal disease. So if they bought a patient with a stab wound, which anemia are we going for? Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage, but again, acute hemorrhagic. Look at the case scenario. These are just clues that can guide you, but again, there could be a twist in the question. If we look at anything to do with a vegetarian or a stomach, B12 pernicious. If we're looking at something to do with, oh, the person has stones in his kidney, oh, the person's kidney is not working. Renal anemia. And what's the thing? EPO. Okay, so what's the treatment? Simple. Give the person EPO. Okay. Aplastic anemia, which is the fourth type of anemia due to not enough RBCs being produced. Aplastic anemia will affect what? Red bone marrow. Red bone marrow. Is red bone marrow just responsible for erythropoiesis? No, all foreign elements. No, all foreign elements. So, a plastic anemia is the one that is going to be accompanied with most complications, kind of, we can say it that way. Why? Because it will be accompanied with other things being less as well. One of them, they can have bleeding disorders. Why would they have bleeding disorder? Because they're not toxic. Exactly. Okay, so. What would be the cause of aplastic anemia? The causes are important. I remember they had, I think, a TBN question regarding this or a quiz question regarding this. Number one cause is? Destruction of bone marrow. Inhibition or the destruction of bone marrow. What's the second cause? Radiation. Yes, exactly. This could be by the radiation and drugs. And another cause is going to be low blood clotting, so low immunity. Okay. Now, the treatment would be? Blood transfusions, right? You would give the person blood transfusions, and usually what you do is you give them hematopoietic stem cells. Why am I giving them hematopoietic stem cells? So stem cells, because their bone marrow is basically being affected here. So we can give them their own stem cells. We can give them harvested stem cells, etc. Okay. Now, sometimes there are too many RBCs being destroyed. So they are being produced, but they're being destroyed more. Okay, what would that cause? It can cause hemolytic anemia. What are the two types of hemolytic anemia? Thalassemia, Thalassemia and, and sickle cell anemia. Okay, now in reticular, uh, in uh, hemolytic anemias, what do we see? We see basically, this is kind of like a weird thing. We see a high reticulocyte count. What did we say about the reticulocyte count? Yes, when we see a high reticulocyte count, we equate it to a high amount of RBCs. But in this case, there is a high reticulocyte count, but because the RBCs are being destroyed so fast that our body continues making more, making more as a homeostatic mechanism. But is it actually helping? Like, are my, like if a person just looks at the reticulocyte count, is it actually helpful? No. no, because the body is making them, but they're being 
destroyed so fast. Okay, now, what's the size of the RPCs here? No. They are going to be, they're gonna be like iron deficiency. I remember this was mentioned in one of the TBLs or something, so that's why I added it over here. I don't know if the book mentions this. It doesn't. It doesn't, but just know it that um, the uh, hemolytic anemia, the RBCs are gonna be like iron deficiency. Okay, which one has macrocytic? Lipid. Lipid. <laughs> Microcytic iron. iron deficiency, right? And as well as? Hemolytic. Yes, hemolytic. Okay, thalassemia. Let's go over this. Thalassemia is what? Mutation in the glycogen. It's a deficiency or a decrease in one of the chains, beta or? Alpha. Alpha. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, in this case, they're again gonna be microcytic. Okay, does anyone uh, have any questions so far? No. Okay. Thalassemia occurs mainly in people of the Mediterranean belt. I think this was mentioned, right? Yeah. In class, right? And the cause would be that one of the globulin chain is? Faulty. Yes, faulty. Absent or even faulty. Erythrocytes, see it mentions that erythrocytes are thin, delicate, and deficient in HB. What does this indicate? Microcytic, right? The shape, the shape. So it indicates that they're microcytic and they're pale. Okay, now we have many subtypes of thalassemia, right? Can someone tell me the subtypes of thalassemia? Alpha and beta. Alpha and beta, right? And in both cases, in this case, alpha is being affected, and in this case, beta is being affected, okay? Uh, the chain, we said that it's made up of four chains. Everyone remembers, right? Yeah. Okay. There is a very long paragraph about thalassemia in the blood notes. Go over it, super, super important. And if you guys have any questions after I'm done with my part, of course you can come to me, okay? Okay, the treatment would be monthly blood transfusions. Does this make sense, everyone? Yeah. Uh, in the blood notes, I think it measure, uh, mentions primary and secondary thalassemia or something. Um, there are two types severe mentioned. And severe Which and one? Severe and? Minor. Which one is commonly mistaken for iron deficiency anemia? Mild. Yes, yeah. mild. mild. Okay. And what's the, the right away thing that you do for severe? The treatment. Blood transfusion. Blood transfusion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do give iron chelatin. Uh, I think that's the name. Chelation. Iron chelation. Yes, iron chelation. I don't know how to pronounce it perfectly, but yeah, we do give that. But for severe, we usually go for blood transfusions. And the mild one is going to be? It's going to be? sometimes mistaken for iron. iron deficiency anemia. So in this case, we don't wanna give the patient so much iron that they have an overdose of iron, but in reality, what did they have? That's Thalassemia, not iron deficiency anemia. Okay. Okay, sickle cell anemia. Again, super, super important. Mentioned in the blood notes, go over that part, okay? Now, what happens, first of all, let's just see, what happens to the red blood cells in sickle cell anemia? Mutation is very sickle. shaped, right? Like a weird crescent shaped, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so guys, whenever you're studying this, um, this part, like the disorders, look at the shape of the RBCs. With each time, what happens to them? Okay, it gives you clues in the question. Okay, in this cause, what's the cause for sickle cell anemia? There is a mutate, mutant form of the beta chain. The other one, what differentiates it from thalassemia is that there's... One is, one is, a, one is a mean, the other is a globulin, I think, no? I'm not really sure about that. Thalassemia is like on the beta or alpha, while yeah. on the EMS. Yes, and also here... What happened? What's the amino acid? Yes. In this case, we have a mutant form. In that case, we could have a whole chain missing, and that's yeah. thalassemia. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a major differentiating point as well. Okay, so here it's just changing one of the amino acids, one of the 146 amino acids. Do you guys have an electron? Yes. Yeah. What do you have? I think I had Arabic too. <laughs> what's, the, what's the date? Is it Tuesday? Yes. No, plus I have it tomorrow. Okay. Okay, let's go over the shape. First of all, what did we say? It's going to be crescent shape and it's going to be spiky, yeah. right? Is this is this good for no, us? No. no. Why? Because it cannot? Yes. 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 And it could get stuck in? 
small capillaries, small capillaries. And that's really, that's one of the things that is so dangerous for the uh, sickle cell anemia. Yeah. Okay, uh, sickle cell anemia, it's common in which type of people? Uh, African descent. African descent, right? And sickle cell anemia, it does what? It decreases the chances of? Malaria. Malaria. Does anyone know why? Because sickle cell is a different shape and malaria can only uh, be connected to that type of cell shape. Yes. Uh, Okay. Yes, yes, yes. You could be right. I really don't remember this part. This is from what I remember. Okay. Because I heard what he mentioned last year to us was that because the uh, the contents are not there, so the malaria cells actually they're not really benefiting from it. You get that? So they don't really come and attack this. But yes, okay, Dr. Bucker mentioned this. This is another point. Did everyone hear him? I think I saw it somewhere too. Uh, so. In the notes or in the book, what you said. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So just know that why it decreases the chances of malaria. Okay, guys? Can you repeat what you said? <laughs> what? Can you please repeat what you said? Uh, malaria, like, this is a blood cell. It's a cell. Mm -hmm. uh, but when it's sickle cell, it's like this. It's malaria a question. Make sense, guys? Everyone heard that? Okay. Guys, sometimes focus with the doctors because some things that they say, they really mean it. Like, you know, they're going to test you on that. Especially students for the Nadir. Because I think maybe this... Last year he wrote our paper, right? No. Most of the questions were... Both of them, but most of the questions were also him. So he, he really, really focused on a part in class and it definitely came. So focus with the Nadir, okay? And your doctor, whoever the doctor is. Uh, I'm sure all of them say important things, so focus with them. Okay, guys? <laughs> okay, so let's go over um, what's the treatment for sickle cell anemia. What do we do for sickle cell anemia patients? There are different courses of treatment, one of them being blood transfusion. When you have anemia, usually we do blood transfusions, right? Another thing is inhale nitric oxide. Guys, remember the treatments for each specific case. They're so, so, so important. So one of them is being inhale nitric oxide. Okay, fetal HB, usually it does not sicken. Okay, no matter what, it does not sicken. But uh, for kids, we usually treat the chronic leukemia using hydroxyurea, and that actually helps with this uh, sickle cell anemia as well. So what are the three things that I've mentioned so far? Uh, blood transfusion, yes. hydroxyurea, and, and uh, nitric oxide. Nitric oxide. All right, the blood notes does go over other things. Please, please, please do the blood notes. Super important. They are going to test you on that. And make sure, because like some, sometimes they do confuse us. Okay, so make sure you focus on each and every sentence. It's important, okay? Okay. And yeah, we do bone marrow. Someone here said bone marrow transplant or something? Yeah, we do that. But again, it's a really uh, risky thing. Okay. Okay, we're done with the anemias, right? Okay, now let's move on to something that's called polycythemia. So overall, we're doing blood disorders. We finished with, if we have erythrocyte disorders. We finished with the fact that, oh, if I have less erythrocytes, okay, anemia. Uh, sorry, the, this type of anemia. What if I have increased erythrocytes? Polycythemia. Polycythemia. So this is increased RBCs. What's the cause of polycythemia? Overproduction of red blood cells, and that would do what? Okay, you have high RBCs. It's more viscosity. More viscosity. They love the word viscosity. Guys, remember when the viscosity increases, and in response to what? It increases. Okay? Okay. Now, with the blood, if you have high viscosity, flows the same way? No. It does not flow the same way. It flows slower. Okay. How many types of polycythemia? Two. 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 Number one. Vera and or primary and then secondary. Which one is pathological, or which one is associated with an issue? Vera. What's the disease? Bone marrow cancer. Exactly. So this one is pathological. Remember this. Okay. And then some things you could experience is going to be dizziness. And then of course your RBC count is going to be fluctuating. It's going to be high. The blood volume is going to double. It's going to become more, of course, right? Because you're producing more. And this will cause the vascular system to be encroached with blood. We have so much blood, right? Okay, guys, bone marrow cancer. What did we say if the bone marrow um, 
something in the anemias. Can someone send me something in the anemia? Oh, plastic anemia. So in that case, what's happened? Everything is low. Everything is low. In this case? Yes. Okay, does that make sense, guys? Remember, when you're going through the chapter, you differentiate between different things, okay? That really helps, because sometimes they bring symptoms and stuff, and it's kind of like the same, you know? So make sure to have key points. Okay, so what would be the treatment? Removing the blood. This is known as therapeutic phlebotomy. Exactly. Secondary polycythemia, it's actually, um, it's not really a big issue. Like, it's not related to a disease. It could be related to what? High altitude. So people who live at higher altitudes, if you actually look at their blood, it's going to be more viscous or more thick than us. And that's because they need it, right? Right? Okay. So they're going to have what? They're going to have low oxygen. High altitudes has low oxygen. We know that. Low oxygen stimulates what? Erythropoietin. So this case, you have? High erythropoietin. Low erythropoietin. What type of anemia? Close the tongue is open. Renal anemia, okay? High erythropoietin? Secondary polycythemia. Okay, it's very common in people with high altitudes. Blood duping. Blood duping is a really small, small part that's mentioned over here. It's not really that, 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 that important, but let's go over it. What's the issue? Okay, blood duping is artificially induced polycythemia. Why would people do that? Athletes. Athletes, athletes do this. Again, to do what? Higher the endurance, right? What they do is basically they give their blood and then they let the erythropoiesis occur. Body replaces the blood that they lost, the erythrocytes. Then they transfuse the blood again. This causes a uh, momentarily increase in their blood volume, right? Yes. Okay. This is um, a chart, okay? It basically uh, mentions. Um, stuff related to the blood nodes. So let's just quickly go over it. So we've covered a bit of the blood nodes as well. Okay, for thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. So what does it mention? First of all, sickle cell anemia is going to be a mutation in? One amino acid. One amino acid. In which chain? Beta. Beta chain, right? Okay. What would be the trans, uh, the, the treatment for sickle cell anemia? Transfusion, right? Right, okay. What else did we mention? We mentioned? Inhaling nitric, Inhaling nitric oxide. And we mentioned uh, hydroxyurea. Okay. Now, um, this is just a basic thing that the beta chains are going to link together, etc., etc. Okay, go over it. Don't skip it. And we did that. There is treatment using vasodilation by nitric oxide inhalation. Okay, we've covered this. And it protects from malaria. We've also covered this. What do we call uh, this type of um, sickle cell anemia? Okay, does it occur in HBF? No, HBF does not sicken. Okay, remember this point. Okay, then we have thalassemia. Now, thalassemia, the erythrocytes are going to be similar to? Iron, Iron deficiency and anemia. So they're going to be thin and thin and delicate. Okay, what are the two types of thalassemia? You guys mentioned alpha thalassemia, you guys mentioned beta thalassemia. Alpha thalassemia occurs on what chromosome? 16. 16. There was a uh, match the following question regarding this. Okay, in uh, one of the bio, bio two exams. <coughs> so, alpha thalassemia will occur on chromosome number 16. And in this case, you don't have the production of alpha chains. Okay, beta thalassemia chromosome? 11. 11, exactly. And in this case, we're gonna give iron chelatin, right? Chelatin is how you pronounce it? Chelation. Okay, in this case, you're going to give iron chelation. Make sense, guys? Okay, let's move on. Okay, guys, can someone read this for me? Yes. A 15-year-old man was admitted to in the hospital. During medical history revealed he is an athlete planning to participate in the Olympics. He admitted to using ethyl injections to increase his calories. What can be seen in his blood test? Increased yes, guys. Increased the red blood cells. Increased red blood cells. Increased what as well? Sorry? Hematocrit. Hem hematocrit. Increased hematocrit. Okay? There's a question like this along the lines of this, and you should know that when you have high amount of erythropoietin, what the results would indicate? They would indicate high amount of hematocrit and high everything associated high with. Sorry? High hemoglobin. High hemoglobin. Everything associated with what EPO would do. 
increase in blood, red blood cell production, and that can be seen in the results, okay? So this was a question we were tested on, or a concept that we were tested on. Okay, can someone read this? Yes. Uh, an obstruction in lung beyond the kidneys would ultimately result in... Which anemia? Uh, anemia. Renal. Renal anemia. Why did you guys come to the conclusion? Because we're talking about the kidneys, right? Again, like I mentioned, if it was something related to the stomach, a uh, person has, for example, something with the stomach. Pernicious, Pernicious anemia. Okay. Okay. This is a really easy question, and it could actually come. So sometimes questions are so easy. Okay. Okay. The doctor understands that the client with pernicious anemia will have which of the following distinguishing laboratory findings? Yes. B, intrinsic factor is absent. Does everyone think of this? Yes, okay. Does this make sense? Yeah. The other options, Asan, did you even take them? I don't think so, right? So sometimes elimination works, okay? Usually, by the way, they don't bring as in like, oh, RBCs are 50 million, the exact same numbers. They're usually not that important, but no, the hematocrit values, the, uh, what did we mention, the plasma values, right? So these are important to know. Did they, did they, did they give us uh, the range, like maybe the with the range on it? Or? Yeah, yeah, they would give you the range. If anything, they would definitely give you the range. I don't think they expect you to know the exact number. Yeah. But of course, like know the, the basic idea, right? So if I say that you have this much, you would kind of think, oh yeah, low, low RBCs, right? But you don't have to know the numbers. Okay. Which blood component is going to contribute to plasma osmotic albumin. pressure? Albumin. Albumin, mainly. Do electrolytes contribute to osmotic pressure? Yes. 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 Also, also the pH. Also the pH. Okay. I think that was the last question for my part. Thank you guys. Well, I'll come back to you for blood okay? Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you all? Awesome, so today I'll be covering with you guys 17.4, 5, and 6, inshallah. Before we start, any uh, questions you want to ask Lucia regarding what she covered? If you have any questions, I'm here, like the whole time, so you guys can come to me, even if it's about the blood notes or something we can go over, okay? Mm -hmm. All right, let's get on with it then. Okay. <laughs> All right, so leukocyte features. So some of them, as a quick kind of overview of the features, we know that they, from all the formed elements, so we have three formed elements. We have the leukocytes, the erythrocytes, we have the platelets. It's only the leukocytes that are complete cells. Why? Because they have nuclei and they have the organelles. Do platelets have organelles? No. Do um, RBCs have the proper organelles and nuclei? No. no. So the only formed element that is a proper cell, we say, is the leukocyte. Now it makes up less than 1%. We said, which part is it when we do centrifugation? Puffy coat, exactly. And the normal range is between 4,800 to 10,800 microliters. Usually they will give you a table with kind of the different measurements and the normal ranges, which will aid you. But just have an overview, just in case it might, a question might come up, give you the abnormal, and then you'd have to guess where it is. Now, if, it, if it's beyond 10,800 microliters, what do we call that in that case? Leukocytosis. Leukocytosis, exactly that. And why does this happen? Infection. Infection. Yeah, exactly. So many different um, causes which we're going to look into, especially when we look into the increase of the different leukocytes. All right, and the main function, of course, is the defense. It's very mobile, very active, can move um, all around the body, okay? Now, guess the feature. Leukocytes are able to split, slip out of the capillary blood vessels. What is the process called? Well done. Biosynthesis. Biosynthesis. Well done. Biosynthesis. The, the sound is really annoying. Okay, so when we, let's think about a leukocyte in the bloodstream having a nice day. There's an infection in the tissue. What's gonna happen? So the first thing that's gonna happen, we're going to see it come towards the endothelial cells simply because we have the CAM molecules. Now, you took that in the um, cells. some stirred, yeah, and, and cells, and you also come here, the cell adhesion molecules, they're going to send signals to the leukocytes, yalla ta'alu, in the uh, endothelial um, uh, area here, and essentially they would go over diaphysis, they would slip out of the blood vessel, and then they're going to go into the tissue. 
Now there is a special movement in the tissue. What do we call that movement? Amboid motion. And that is aided with the cellular extensions that they make exactly inside of the tissue. But then where do they go once they get into the tissue? How do they know where they go? Positive chemotaxis. Right. So there, they're kind of like, where do we go? And then we have the positive chemotaxis trail. So this trail is a trail made of uh, chemicals, and these chemicals are released from either other leukocytes or they're released from the damaged cells, um, damaged tissue too. Okay? All clear so far? Yeah. Great. Alrighties, so we have two groups of uh, leukocytes. We have granulocytes and we have a granulocyte. Now from the name, which one has granules? Granulocytes. Which one doesn't? Granulocytes. Nice. So we have three granulocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, and we also have basophils. Then monocytes and the leukocytes, uh, sorry, lymphocytes are going to be the A granulocytes. Now, can I ask you over there back there looking at your iPad, yes you, please stand up and tell us, <laughs> can you put this in order of, of the, um, the most common, no, 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 you, come on, come on, yes, and, and here's aid to help you with the most common of the leukocytes to the least common, and these are some options you can pick from, A, you choose A, monocytes, no. Should we get C? Huh? That's easy. D? Who says D? You all are correct. Well done. Why? Never let monkeys eat bananas. Never let them eat bananas. And I hope you do not remember. Okay? If I see you, I'll, I'll ask you another question later. Anyways, never let monkeys eat bananas. This will always help you and trigger your memory to remember the order. Okay? Amazing. Okay, which of the following is the most abundant A granulocyte? <coughs> Never let so lymphocytes. Perfect. There you go. Come on. Okay, so the, what are the unique features now of the granulocytes? Now, as you can see, for all of them, they have the lobed nuclei. Um, which one has the most lobes in general? Exactly. They have around three to six lobes in general, and they stain with white stain. Now, white stain, have you guys done, uh, did you do that in bio lab? No, yes? Some of you, yeah. So we, we, we know that the white stain has two different types of stain. We have methylene blue, and we have the um, innocent stain, or yeah, innocent stain. And essentially, that's acidic and basic. So that allows whatever acidic components to take in the acidic dye, and then the basic components to take in the basic dye, okay? So let's have a look at which one is acidic, which one is basic, and which one is neutral, like our friend here, neutrophil. So the neutrophils actually take in the basic and they take in the, uh, the um, acidic dye. All right, and as we know, they're the most common, 50 to 70% of the leukocytes are neutrophils. They, because they take in both the acidic, acidic is red, and then the basic is going to be blue. Now, red, blue, a little bit of art here we give. So yeah, a lilac color, which is the neutral color. So we have granules here too, um, because they're granulocytes. Now the, granu uh, the granules here, specific to the neutrophils, we have defensins. Now defensins have our uh, antimicrobial proteins. If we think about antimicrobial proteins, usually we, we think about acute uh, bacterial infections. So when you think about acute bacterial infections, you need to automatically think about neutrophils, okay? How about chronic? I know I'm, I'm skipping ahead here. Monocytes. Monocytes, exactly. When I think about chronic then infections, I need to think about monocytes. Um, another of the granules, a really important one, is the lysosomes. Now, uh, neutrophils are phagocytic in nature, meaning that they will essentially... Okay, let me skip to this other slide. They will phagotize whatever bacteria is present and some fungi and essentially create the phagosome, release the hydrolytic enzymes and break it down. And then whatever remnants releases them out. Okay, now this is very important um, 
in, in terms, uh, again, of acute bacterial infections. Now, one way it kills this bacteria is through something we call the respiratory burst. What it does, it metabolizes the oxygen, this, uh, this, um, and uh, this oxidized material will essentially be either bleach or it will be hydrogen peroxide. And that will essentially ultimately do what to the bacteria? Kill it, yeah, kill it. Another thing it does, as we said, in the, some granules have defensins. Defensins are going to create holes in the membrane of the bacteria, and eventually that also helps with the killing of the bacteria. Clear so far? Perfect. All right, isinophils, isino. So we said isino is the what? Is which component? The acidic or basic component? Acidic. acidic component. So we're expecting it to stain red or blue? Red. red. So we're expecting the granules, as we can see over here, some of the granules, kind of red. Now, if I look, they're actually purple, but some man more fruit, yeah, I'm going to red. Um, uh, something really important about the granules is that they're coarse. Now, with neutrophils, they're fine granules. Here, with the xenophils, they're coarse, meaning that they're rough. Um, another thing very, very distinct to the xenophils is that they're bilobed. So whenever you see bilobed, just it's referring to the xenophils and also the coarse granules being staining red. Now, when I see parasitic worm, and, uh, uh, parasitic worm taking part in any way, I need to think about isinophils. Okay, what if it didn't tell me I, I have a parasitic worm? What's another hint that could be present? Allergy. It could be allergy, but it's, there's another one that's more related to allergies: the basophils. Asthma. Um, asthma. Yeah, true. That's in the textbook. But the, uh, the, the main one that's linked to allergies and anaphylactic reactions would be the basophils, even though the textbook says uh, no, it also take, takes part. Now, in, in reality, most of the leukocytes do take part, right? But for here, uh, one hint that you can think about is the fact that there is holes that are present in the digestive tract or in the respiratory tract. That indicates that the worms have basically bored into the membrane of the respiratory tract or the, the digestive tract. And that was seen uh, previously in, some, in, in a question or two. All right, so this is kind of the hint that you can take. But again, once you see parasitic worm, this is an indication of xenophils. We're probably going to see it being raised. Okay? Great. Now, basophils, as I said, someone said, um, you said allergies or asthma, right? So mainly, mainly, basophils are linked to anaphylactic and allergic reactions. Why? Because in their granules, they have histamine. Histamine does what? Does vasodilation, allowing that blood flow to come in if there's any allergen, trying to get rid of that allergen, inducing the infl uh, inflammatory reaction. Now, it's very similar to the other, another cell, but it's not in the same cell Mast lineage. Cells. Mast cells, exactly. Um, and again, kind of the distinct features that we need to know here for the basophils is the fact that their nuclei is U-shaped or S-shaped, okay? And what is the stain that it takes up here? Blue. Blue. Basal, basic, so it's going to take a blue color. Great. All right, who wants to read this question and give it an attempt? Who's the... Okay, go for it. A five-year-old boy was admitted to the hospital due to severe abdominal pain. Stool analysis revealed that a parasitic infection, which of the following is most likely to be seen in the blood? What's the key word here? Uh, parasitic. Parasitic. So what is the answer? Uh, I forgot C. C. C, red granules with bilobed nucleus indicating what? Uh, Xenophils. And we said parasitic, Taban is xenophiles. Well done. Great job. Okay, who wants to answer this question? Do you want to go for it? Yeah, go for it. Uh, two year old boy was admitted to the hospital due to severe and uh, reaction. Which of the following blood cell types most likely involved or responsible for the cause of the reaction? So if it's an anaphylactic reaction, so which leukocyte am I referring to? Basophil. Basophil. So which of these characteristics are more linked to basophils? Let's do the process of elimination. Do basophils, do they have red granules? No. no. Okay, let's have a look at the A shape nucleus? Does it have and blue granules? Yeah. yeah, it does. So the answer is B. But let's have a look at C and D. So C, does it have, is it multi-lobed? Is it, is it known for that? What's known for it being multi-lobed? Neutrophils, perfect. And D, cell with kidney-shaped nucleus? We haven't covered that, but that would be the uh, mono, monocytes, yeah. All right, perfect, yeah. What's an, uh, what's an anaphylactic reaction again? 
an anaphylactic reaction okay say for example someone is allergic to who has an allergy peanuts so anaphylactic reaction would be like an allergic reaction okay so uh, usually then uh, the bacteria would be important and the the release of the same okay perfect okay who wants to try this question do you want to try it me yeah <laughs> Which of the following blood cells kill a pathogen uh, by using a defensin containing granules? Okay, so if it's defensin containing, so which leukocyte are we thinking of? Um, neutrophils. Neutrophils, perfect. Which of these characteristics are more linked to neutrophils? D. D. Well done. Good job. Uh, do you guys understand why it's D? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. Last one. Which of the following blood cells release granules that intensify the inflammatory response? Now, because I answered that question for you, which one is it? Well done. Great job. Okay. All right. So now we go into the agranulocytes. The agranulocytes, as you can see, there are no distinct cytoplasmic granules that we can see, and their nuclei are not lobed. Instead, for monocytes, they're mainly, they look like a, it looks like a kidney over here. I, I, that's the best picture I could get with it looking like a small kidney. But this is a bit of a deformed kidney. And then the lymphocyte is more of like a spherical shape. Okay? All right. Now, lymphocytes, um, they make up 25%. Never let. So that would be 20. Well, what did we say the neutrophils were? Around 50 to 70%. Yeah? Perfect. So I tried to find a very pixelized image and I got it. I didn't aim for a pixelized image, but that kind of shows the very spherical shape of the nuclei and how it takes most of the space. And the cytoplasm only appears as this blue rim. Okay, so that's the distinct feature. Blue cytoplasmic rim, and then we have the purple nucleus taking most of the space of the actual uh, lymphocyte. Now, a lymphocyte, most of it is going to be found in the lymphoid tissue, part of the lymphatic system, which inshallah you guys are going to take this semester. Have fun. Okay. Right. So the lymphocytes are going to be split into two different lymphocytes when they kind of become activated and there's a and differentiate. Either it's going to become a B cell or it's going to become a T cell. Now B cells, they're going to develop into plasma cells and then they're going to release antibodies. T cells, on the other hand, they're going to directly kill either tumor uh, cells or virus infected cells. So whenever you see the keywords tumor cell or um, a virus infected cell, I'm going to think about a T cell. Whenever I'm going to think about re uh, releasing antibodies, that's going to be a B cell. Okay? Perfect. Any questions so far? Cool, cool. All right. Monocytes, which are the largest. There was a question before asking which of the following leukocytes are the largest <laughs> leukocyte. It's going to be the monocyte. Never let monkeys. So going to be the third most common, 38%. Um, once they exit the bloodstream and enter into the tissue, they're going to become macrophages. Now macrophages, like another leukocyte that we talked about, is phagocytic, which is neutrophils. Okay, but the neutrophils, they're acute bacterial infection. Hina, monocytes are what? Chronic uh, infections, um, like tuberculosis. They, so they, it says in the textbook, they also take part in viruses, bacterial parasites, but this overlaps with the other. So what's the unique feature? The idea of chronic infections. So it always try to pinpoint and highlight the uh, main feature. All right. Okay, so here is a question. Who is going to be my volunteer this time? Do you want to be my volunteer? Me? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go for it. What is the probability of case? Probable cause for this. Okay, so over here you've got the counts, you've got the patient's results, and you've got the normal ranges. Now I want you to compare. One example is uh, to the bacterial infection. Bacterial infection, well done. Did you see this before? I thought this Good, good. All right, so leukopenesis, we went. I'm just Oh, okay. <laughs> Stretching the muscles. Okay, uh, leukopoiesis. So, leukopoiesis is essentially the production of the leukocytes. Okay, uh, can, uh, what was the production of red blood cells? Erythropoiesis. Perfect. And erythropoiesis dependent on EPO, right? Erythropoietin. But here, for leukocytes, we're going to depend on two other things. 
We're going to depend on um, interleukins and colony stimulating factors. The CSF, not the CSF of the brain. Khalas, we left that in semester one. Another CSF, okay? Um, now, these, uh, the EPO and the um, CSF and the interleukins, they can essentially be used uh, for different applications, clinical applications. For example, they can be used in cell, um, chemotherapy, stem cell transplant, protection against AIDS, and that's the only thing that you really need to know for homeostatic imbalance. And no, they can be used for these three cases over here, okay? Because they help generate, um, or they help promote essentially leukopoiesis, to, for example, fight against infections in that case, or if it's erythropoietin, get the RBCs back, increasing the um, oxygen um, carrying capacity. All right? Perfect. All right, I need another volunteer. You can be my volunteer. Now, this is a big task. I need the... Uh, would you come up? There's no one behind you. <laughs> uh, and there's a pen. So I would like you to match... Over here, these are the leukocyte disorders. Now you guys help her, of course. Uh, and let me give you guys a minute. Now work as a team to try to unlock the leukocyte disorder. And think that, I can't find the card. Uh, okay, go. Okay, first one. Is Two is four. Okay, well then, let's see. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, give her a round of applause. Um, okay, awesome. Let's check. So, leukopenia, do we all agree that's low um, white blood cell count? Yes. Perfect. Uh, leukemia, overproduction of abnormal white blood cells, death is mainly due to internal hemorrhage if left untreated, do we agree? Yeah. Perfect. Uh, chronic leukemia, uh, more common in elderly, it slowly advances and involves proliferation of later cell stages, do we agree? Yes. Perfect. Acute leukemia would be the opposite, more common in children, quickly advances and involved, involved in the proliferation of the stem cells, agree? Yeah. Perfect. What do we have left? Uh, mononucleosis. So, uh, where is that? Patient is achy and presents with a chronic sore throat. So these are the keywords over here. Once you see them in the question, know that it's referring to mononucleosis. Low grade fever, excess lymphocytes appear like monocytes. Now, mononucleosis is due to which virus? Uh, Epstein Parr Epstein virus. Yeah, well done. Perfect. Any confusion here with the leukocyte disorders? Okay. If you, this is kind of like a summary. I said better, better than Nana, I have to go through every one of them. Uh, it's a nice, quick summary um, to, to go over. Okay, perfect. Uh, we'll share the slides with you guys, inshallah, after the session so you can go over it too. And these are just the answers. Okay, who would like to uh, answer this one? Did you read the question? Maybe it's not. Okay, who wants to read the question? Would you like to read it? Go for it. A 72-year-old patient was admitted to the hospital complaining of mild fever, shortness of breath, and tiring or minimal activity. After a full investigation, his blood test showed leukemia. He was given different cycles of chemotherapy, but still complaining of fever. One month later, his son indicated that he, he had minimal trauma while walking in the garden of the hospital, and unfortunately, he passed away immediately before the arrival of a doctor. Which of the following is the most common cause of death in this case? Internal bleeding. Okay. So yeah, it was internal bleeding indeed because of the picture. <laughs> but so, yeah, I mean, I was stupid to put the picture in the slides. But um, in the textbook, there are actually two causes highlighted, right? So we have the internal bleeding and overwhelming infection. Best, uh, you would have to read the case in order to understand. Is it asking you for overwhelming infection or is it asking you for internal bleeding? Okay, but in this case, because there was trauma, so most probably, it would be the internal bleeding, all right? Unless stated otherwise. All right, 
A uh, 72-year-old patient is admitted to the hospital complaining of mild fever, shortness of breath, uh, tiring of minimal activity. After full investigation, his blood test showed leukemia. He was given different cycles of chemotherapy, but still complaining of fever. One month later, his son indicated that he had minimal trauma while walking in the garden um, of the hospital. Unfortunately, he passed away immediately before the arrival of the doctor. Which type of blood cell is most probably lower than normal? RBCs. RBCs. Why? Yeah. Leukemia, right? So there's an overcrowding of the leukocytes in the bone marrow, and that is basically affecting the production of the RBCs. Well done. And you can honestly do it by the process of elimination. Okay, great. Yeah, and I just left a reminder here. A 70-year-old male is suffering from leukemia. The cancerous cell in the patient says that an agranulocyte with dark purple spherical. So uh, which of the types would it be? Now, 70-year-old male, meaning is it going to be chronic or acute? Chronic. If it's spherical nucleus with a rim, what would it be? Lymphocytic. So the answer is chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Well done. Okay, over here I have a chronic sore throat and a low grade fever. So what would that be? Is it monocytes? No, lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Now, the lymphocytes, essentially because of the changes that happen to them, they appear as monocytes, but it's not monocytes. So that's a, a, a question that might confuse you, but the answer is lymphocytes. All right? Done. All right, so now we're done with the lymphocytes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so any questions regarding leukocytes? Do you go ahead and hop into platelets? All right, let's go, go into platelets. So platelets are essentially cell fragments of megacardiocytes. I don't wanna go into the stages, but essentially it goes into one, two, three, and four, and then four, we start to have five. We have start to have these cellular extensions, and these cellular extensions are going to press onto the sinusoid, okay? Um, one type, uh, a type of failure. Starts to press, once it presses, essentially, it just the, the fragments are going to be removed from these cellular extensions, releasing them into the bloodstream, and that's how we have the little fragments of the platelets. Now, the platelets are really, really tiny. Um, they stain purple, which have chemicals required for clotting. They form the temporary plug. We're going to go over the steps now of the, the clotting. Uh, they're anucleate, meaning they don't have a nucleus. So if they do not have a nucleus, what do you think their lifespan is going to be? Short. Short lifespan. What doesn't have a nucleus to you? Red blood cells. They don't have a nucleus to you and also have a shorter lifespan compared to the leukocytes. Um, now, this is really important. Nitric oxide with prostacyclin. These are two things that are found in the bloodstream, all right, which essentially are going to inactivate, uh, inactivate the platelets. So they make sure that the platelets do not aggregate and clot and form clots when it's unnecessary. So nitric oxide and prostacyclins are very two important chemicals, and you might see them in some questions, but they make sure and no, no unnecessary clots are formed. And then like how we had CSF and interleukins for leukocytes, and we had erythropoietin for um, red blood cells, we also have thrombopoietin, which basically um, regulates the generation of the platelets. All right, yes. So that was literally 17.5. Like, that's a really small part. Hemostasis. Hemo means? Blood. Stasis means? Stop. Stopping or halting something. Exactly. So we're trying to stop the blood loss. We're trying to contain it when we have an injury. Let's have a look. All right. So the first thing with hemostasis is going to be a vascular spasm. Now, why do we need that vascular spasm? To decrease the blood loss. It decrease the blood loss, exactly. Imagine if I have, for example, vasodilation instead, what's gonna happen, blood flow, it's going to, the blood is going to go everywhere because there's so much blood flow, I'm going to have a lot of blood loss. So with this vasoconstriction, I'm actually minimizing the amount of blood loss by 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and the, 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 this vaso, uh, sorry, this vasoconstriction or vascular spasm is mainly triggered or is um, yani induced by three factors. Direct injury of the smooth muscle. It could be chemicals that are going to be released by the endothelial cells and the activated platelets. And lastly, reflexes by the local pain receptors. We're all going to feel pain if a knife cuts through us. And at the same time, we also have other factors that are going to protect us, okay? Okay, now, 
The second thing that's going to happen is going to be the platelet plug formation. Now, we said there are two chemicals that prevent the platelets from aggregating on their own. What were they? <laughs> Sorry, the prostacyclins. Perfect. So that's in the intact endothelium. Now, what if there's an injury? What will happen is that the platelets will start to adhere onto the endothelial um, kind of wall by adhering to the collagen by something we call here the von Willebrand factor. So the von Willebrand factor will essentially connect the collagen to the platelet via a bridge, and that's how we make our first connection to form a platelet plug. Okay. Now, the activated platelets usually the platelets are just you know spherical in shape. That's how they normally look like. Once they're activated, they start to look at like these toys. Have you ever you guys ever touched the toys that are spiky and they're kind of like sticky yeah. and then over time they collect these like hairs and then they become yeah. disgusting so that's basically how they um they sums up their characteristics they become spiky they become stickier to allow them to aggregate to each other to form the platelet plug um and then uh, that essentially um allows them you know for a better um plot now the release of chemical messengers that induces uh, induces this change First thing that we have is the ADP, adenosine uh, diphosphate. This is an aggregating agent, but we have serotonin and thromboxane A2, thromboxane A2 and serotonin do two things, aggregating agents, but they also enhance the vascular spasm. So if a question comes up and it asks you about um, chemicals that aid the vascular spasm, you can also, um, some of your options should at least contain serotonin and thromboxane A2. All right, perfect. Oh, what type of feedback is involved with platelet aggregation? Positive, positive, feedback. positive feedback. Who can explain to me why the positive feedback? Because um, yeah. okay. um, uh, as more platelets like are going due to the vulnerable factor, they release some other chemicals which more platelets. Exactly. Well done. Perfect. And it goes on and on and on. Great job. Okay. Which of the following is involved in the platelet plug formation? D, thromboxan A2. Why is it not nitric oxide and prostacyclin? They prevent the They actually prevent it. Why is it not vitamin K? It's for the clotting factors. For the clotting factors. That's not the platelet plug. So make sure to differentiate between the platelet plug and the formation uh, and the coagulation process. And that's where we come in, the coagulation process. So reinforces the platelet plug with the fibrin uh, threads. Involves clotting factors, most of them are synthesized by the liver, but there are four clotting factors which require a, vit a vitamin, which is vitamin K. Now, I, I tried to find anything to help you guys remember this. Two plus seven is, not not, uh, is nine, not 10. Okay, or, yeah, so that's just one way to, to remember the uh, four clotting factors that a vitamin K um, is required in order to form these. Now, activation of any of these clotting factors will essentially form an enzyme, except the last step, which is from fibrinogen to fibrin, because we're not producing an enzyme, we're producing fibrin mesh. But any other other than that is going to produce an enzyme, and that enzyme will help activate the, um, the, the next clotting factor, and so on and so forth. And they do this by clipping off a piece of that um, uh, clotting factor to produce the enzyme. Clear? Perfect. Moving on. Okay, so coagulation, we know it's split into different steps. Now, you guys are not required, of course, to know the steps of the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. All you need to know is from the part where it says per thrombin activator, per thrombin to thrombin, alhamdulillah. So when you get into the uh, per thrombin activation, we need to know the two different pathways. We have the intrinsic pathway and we have the extrinsic pathway. So there are, there are two different pathways, they still do have some commonalities. First of all, the fact that they require negative services. But which one more specifically requires negative services? The intrinsic, exactly. That more specifically, best both of them still require it. Um, both of them, the platelets are going to essentially display the phosphatidyl uh, serine, PF3. That's just something in common. And then they also have a common intermediate, which is factor X. Now, this is really important to hear because in order to form the thro prothrombin activator, I need four different things. I need um, factor X, factor V, I need the calcium, and I need a phospholipid surface, which is a negative surface. So I need these four things. So this one, uh, this is really important in that case, okay? Now, if I go then to the intrinsic pathway, as I said, 
I need negative surfaces. For example, it could be glass, it could be the phospholipid, activate the platelets, collagen. But in another thing before, it's because it's intrinsic, it's in the blood. So the factors are found in the blood. Extrinsic, it's gonna be out of the blood, okay? And as you can see, so this over here is the intrinsic, this is the extrinsic. How many, these have more steps in comparison to the extrinsic, so I'm expecting which one to be slower? The intrinsic. Intrinsic should be slower because I have more intermediates and I generally have more steps. Extrinsic pathway, on the other hand, I'm getting a tissue factor. It requires this tissue factor from its name tissue and a factor that's in the tissue. It's not in the blood, so that's why it's extrinsic. Um, and then again, uh, that's when basically the blood is exposed to the out, uh, outside of the tissue. And I have the tissue factor, which is also known as factor number three. All right. Prothrombin activator catalyzes the conversion of what into the active enzyme what? Prothrombin into thrombin. Well done. So that would be the thrombin then um, activation. That's all you need to know for step number two. So phase one, we had intrinsic extrinsic. Phase number two, prothrombin to thrombin by the uh, prothrombin activator. Great. All right. Then we get into the last part, which is the formation of the fibrin mesh. So now I produce my thrombin. So this thrombin is now an enzyme and it's going to help me convert the fibrinogen into the fibrin. So fibrinogen, is it soluble or insoluble? Uh, soluble. Soluble. It's going to become insoluble. And now I'm producing the mesh, it's tough, and essentially forms these webs over here. So I, it's going to go from soluble fibrinogen into insoluble fibrin. Um, and as we said before, in this kind of last step, we're not producing an enzyme, instead we're producing a mesh. Now this fibrin is going to make the plasma, instead of the plasma being a liquid, it's going to increase its viscosity and it's going to be gel-like, trapping everything in so that they don't basically spread to other parts. When you have an injury, you don't want the injury to spread, you want it to be localized. And we're going to look at some of the things that allow it to be localized. Now, in the presence of uh, calcium ions, thrombin activates the fibrin sta stabilizing factor, and that helps the fibrin basically to come together and form the fibrin mesh. So with calcium, and I need thrombin, allowing me to activate the fibrin stabilizing factor. Okay? Okay. Hello. Which of the following sub substance released in the first step of hemostasis causes a vascular spasm? Mm -hmm. Let's see, uh, serotonin, yes, correct, it is D. Does everyone know why it's D? Perfect. Let's have a look. Okay, clot retraction. Retraction, I'm pulling, I'm bringing something closer to me. I'm retracting it. I want you to think after, okay, so I have created this clot. It's now there. What am I going to do with it? Am I, am I going to leave the clot? No, over time, I'm going to require some healing process to happen. So I need to do some clot retraction. I need to bring, so for example, imagine the blood vessel got cut. I need to bring the edges back in together. So that would be blood retraction. And the way to remember, it's as if as you're suturing the skin. You're bringing the threads in together and you're bringing them closer. And when you're bringing them closer, that's going to release some serum. All right? But the whole point of it is the idea that um, we're able to essentially draw the edges of the um, blood vessels together. Why? Because the platelets contain a contractile proteins. And we took from the muscular chapter in semester one, we have actin and mycin, both of which are contractile proteins, allowing um, contraction to happen. Okay, so that's one of the characteristics of the platelets, allowing for, for a clot retraction to basically occur. At the same time, clot retraction is happening, we also have healing happening. And there's two important growth factors, one released by the platelets and one released uh, by the endothelial um, sets. Or, yeah. So the first one is the platelet-derived growth factor released by the platelets, essentially allowing the vascular smooth muscle to multiply and heal. And also we have the fibroblast to divide and heal. Vascular endothelial growth from its name, we're healing and we're multiplying the endothelial cells and we're bringing them back to normal. Okay, so these two growth factors are very important when we talk about the healing process. Now take this into consideration and try to answer this with all the knowledge that we have about platelets. Which of these is not secreted by platelets? C. C, vasoconstrictors. But we did say 
we it takes its due release on chemicals when we talk about the vascular spasm. And the What's first step is it B growth factor? We have the platelet derived growth factor. Is it A? It's A, right? Because thrombopoietin, what, what does it do? It regulates the formation of the platelet. But can the platelet, for example, the RBC, does it release the erythropoietin? So the answer is A, as you correctly said, because it does uh, release uh, pro uh, procoagulants, it does release vasoconstrictors, and it does release growth factor. All good? Perfect. Okay. Fibrin, no lysis. So the fibrin is basically being degenerated. We're breaking them down. Uh, what's going to happen? So I need to break down the fibrin. So the way I'm going to do this is I need the plasminogen, which is also a plasma protein. I need it to be converted to plasmin. How do I do that conversion? I need a plasminogen activator. Now this plasminogen activator is going to be released by the endothelial cells. Um, and this is basically induced by the fact that I have a clot in the blood vessel. Over time, I'm no longer going to need that clot because I'm healing anyway. So I need to remove it so that the endothelial cells try to release the plasminogen activator. Also know that um, we have the factor number 12 and thrombin also aiding with the release of the plasminogen activator to convert the plasminogen into plasmin. And then the plasmin is essentially going to degrade the fibrin down. And that's how, that's basically a summary of the fibrinolysis. Okay. All right. I need another volunteer. You didn't come up. Yeah. Sad. I don't know. I don't know. I don't Well done, thank you. All right, so clot retraction draws the ruptured edges of the blood vessels together, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Did you say? Okay, great. Uh, fibr fibrinolysis, degradation of the fibrin mesh, is it? Perfect. And wh what's the conversion of fibrinolysis? Plasminogen into? Plasmin. Well done. By the plasminogen activating factor. Meshi, intrinsic path, uh, extrinsic pathway, sorry. So that requires the blood is exposed to the tissue factor. Intrinsic, these are the causing factors found within the blood, which is correct. Well done. Okay, moving on. Okay, so now we know our processes really well. And here is the answer. So, in which choice are the proteins listed in order in which they are activated? B. So, B. Well done. Because we start with the prothrombin activator, then the thrombin, and then the fibrin. Good job. Okay, which of the following enzyme plasma protein is required to function when unneeded clots should be removed as healing of the injured blood vessels is happening? Antithrombin. Okay, so the key word here is unneeded clots are being removed. So which which part did we say that would be? B. So that's the uh, clotting factors. Plasminogen activator, because it would be the fibrin lysis, because we're removing any of the, the, the fibrin, essentially. So it wouldn't be the antithrombin 3. Antithrombin 3 would come later on where, when we're talking about anticoagulants. Uh, it wouldn't be the fibrin st uh, stabilizing factor, because that stabilizes the fibrin and the, uh, the clot, so that doesn't make sense. And for thrombin activator, again, we can eliminate that, because that's at the beginning. So the answer would be? Do you guys understand why it's B? Yeah. Perfect. All right, let's move on. Okay, so factors limiting normal clot growth. Clots do not form in rapidly moving blood. As we, 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 we said in the very, very first step, what do we need to do? We need to do vascular spasm or vasoconstriction. If we have the blood essentially flowing all over, can the platelets form the mesh? Can we essentially do all the things that we talked about? We can't. So if the blood is moving very, very fast, then the platelets are going to be diluted and we can't form the mesh and we can't therefore form the clot. Thrombin also has to be restricted. We can't let thrombin go everywhere and essentially form clots all over the body. That's not going to be healthy. 
But in that case, why? Because thrombin, first of all, speeds up, it does like a positive feedback and speeds up a prothrombin activator. And another thing, it actually enhances the intrinsic pathway. So these two things are really dangerous. If we continue on forming berberin mush and then the clot, in this case, where's the healing process going to start, right? So we need to limit it and restrict it. So what substances can help restrict the thrombin? And I think, who is sitting here? Yeah. Anti-thrombin. Anticoagulants, right? So let's have a look at the anticoagulants. So for one of them was the anti-thrombin 3, as you correctly said. We also have fibrin and piperin. So fibrin is going to be like a fishnet, as we said. It's going to restrict the thrombin to that specific area um, and essentially prevents the clot from enlarging. Thank you very much. Perfect. So over here, we have, as we said, the uh, fibrin. Then we have the anti-thrombin 3. The anti-thrombin 3, what it will do, it will essentially inactivate a thrombin. Anything that's not bound to the fibrin is going to act inactivate it. Now we have protein C, heparin, and the anti-prothrombin 3. What they're going to try to do is also inactivate or inhibit the activity of the intrinsic pathway. And the last one is heparin. Now heparin is released by two types of cells, naturally produced in the body, but they're also used actually as drugs. Mast cells and vasculars. And what they do is essentially they are going to, first of all, as we said, they're going to inhibit the intrinsic pathway, but they're also going to enhance the anti prothrombin 3. Now, why I put this is because heparin is a, is a team player. They're going to help their team members and they're going to help anti prothrombin 3 to also, you know, um, take part in, in the anticoagulant kind of uh, nature. Anticoagulant, um, anticoagulant drugs, we have aspirin, heparin again, and warfarin. Now, with aspirin, it's going to inhibit thromboxan A2. Okay, so that's the key here. When it says inhibiting thromboxan A2, we're going to focus on that. When did we need thromboxan A2? To prevent the aggregation. Prevent? Uh, uh, no, 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 no. Help enhance aggregation and enhance the vascular spasm. So we need it in these two. In heparin, a very specific kind of clinical application would be the venous thrombosis. That's a very specific clinical application that might come up in a question. And warfarin is going to, um, a, again, a clinical aspect, uh, uh, application is if a patient has a risk of a stroke and has atrial fibrillation. So if I see venous thrombosis, most probably heparin. If I see at atrial fibrillation, most probably it's going to be warfarin. Um, another thing that's very important is that the warfarin is actually going to try to inhibit the action of the vitamin K. Remind me, what were the clotting factors that vitamin K helped in producing? 7, 2, 9, 10. Yeah. 7, 3, 10. 2 plus 7 is 9. And not 7, 10. 9. Great. Yeah, All right. I have a question regarding this, right? What's the mechanism of action for warfarin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Then, guys, I forgot to read the whole option, and then there was vitamin K, but I selected vitamin C. Read the option, because it actually, what does it do? It, uh, it prevents the action of vitamin uh, K in producing the clotting factors. Clotting factors. But it didn't mention it. It just said, oh, it prevents the action of warfarin. Some something, clotting yeah, factors. Yeah, something weird about vitamin K. Yeah, perfect. So a 50-year-old male patient is undergoing an open heart surgery. He was injected with an anticoagulant drug during the procedure. This chemical agent and the drug is also naturally in some leukocytes. Which of the following? So I'm thinking of which of the anticoagulants? Thinking of? Heparin. So you're saying it inhibits thromboxan A2? Does it do that? Which one does that? Aspirin. That's aspirin. So it's not D. What would it be? C, it enhances the anti-thrombin um, anti 3 activity. If it's naturally occurring, I'm preferring back to heparin. The heparin, that's what it does. Remember, H, heparin is the superstar. Let me go back to the star. Maybe you didn't see the fact that it was a team player. Team player, okay. Yeah, so it's going to uh, help in that. Oh, wait, did I skip a question? Okay. Uh, a patient with a heart problem has been prescribed the drug to prevent abnormal clotting by interfering with the action of a vitamin required for a normal blood clotting. Which one is it? Warfarin. Warfarin. It's going to interfere with which, which vitamin? Vitamin K. Vitamin K. Well done. Good job. Okay. Okay. Disorder of hemostasis. This is the last thing that we're going to do, inshallah. So thromboembolic disorders. Um, okay, so let's play a game together. Um, I'm going to read a statement and you try to guess which of these am I referring to. 
I am a clot that develops and persists in an unbroken blood vessel. My thrombosis, coronary thrombosis, um, emb embolus or an embolism? Thrombosis. Whoa, who said what? Who says thrombosis? You didn't say thrombosis. Who's saying an embolus? Who's saying embolism? Who's saying nothing? <laughs> So, okay, so it persists in an unbroken blood vessel. It stays there, localized in that place. So it's most probably going to be a thrombosis. Okay, so you're right. I used to flow free in the bloodstream, and now I'm obstructing a narrow blood vessel. Embolism. Embolism, exactly. So it used to be an embolus, used to be free in the bloodstream, found a narrow vessel, becomes an embolism. I'm a blockage in the coronary circulation. If you don't act fast, the heart dies coronary thrombosis. I used to be called thrombosis, but I broke free from the uh, vessel wall. It's going to be an embolus. Okay? Does that, do these make sense? Perfect. All right. So as we said, an embolus is a free guy, unlike thrombosis. Bye. Uh, good luck in your Islamic or Arabic. Um, and then we have, uh, of course, when it breaks free, it then becomes an embolus. Okay? Great. Thrombolytic diseases, now some of the risk factors. Now I want you to think about atherosclerosis and think about over here inflammation. What's happening to the lumen over here in these two? It's getting smaller. Narrowed. So the lumen over here when it's inflamed, and uh, this is usually chronic inflammation, and over here atherosclerosis is narrowed. So imagine the blood, the, it increases the likelihood of the blood being restricted. And when it clumps together, then we're more likely then to produce clots. And then we're going to produce, you know, unnecessarily clots. So that's one of the risk factors. Another risk factor is slowly flowing blood. Usually, for example, if we have bedridden patients in the hospital, uh, you're going to see that the doctors are not going to leave them immobile like this. They will try to move their legs. They try to move their hands in order to make sure that the blood is flowing and no clots are being formed. Subhanallah, if they stay bedridden for a really long time, we're going to see, you know, clots forming all around the body. Uh, and yeah, okay. Just trying to finish this muscle right now. Uh, thrombocytopenia, penia, decrease, or we have a deficiency. So if I have a deficiency in the platelets, that's going to be thrombocytopenia. What is what are these purplish spots over here? We call them fatty hairs. So the fatty hair are is, is the main kind of uh, symptom or sign of thrombocytopenia. La causes could be bone marrow malignancy, exposure to ionizing radiation. Basically, it doesn't matter what it is. Where? Yes, perfect, thank you. And it suppresses and destroys the bone marrow, all right? A treatment for this would be the transfusion of concentrated uh, platelets or the clotting factors themselves. Okay. This over here is impaired liver function. We said that the liver is very important to produce what? El plasma proteins. Now, if and these plasma proteins to produce the el, el clotting factors. If we don't have the clotting factors, then we, we can't um, essentially have the clotting formation. So, if we say, for example, we have cirrhosis, which is one of the liver, um, liver failures, um, then there's going to be a problem with the clot formation when we have any injuries, but also if we have a vitamin K deficiency. Now, who is likely to have a vitamin K deficiency? Neonates. Neonates often have a vitamin K deficiency. That's why it's really important that they take a vitamin K shot once they are born in order to help them uh, form a clotting and, and, and do that. Uh, what else? Okay, so if we have a, a liver disease, um, say cirrhosis, for example, two things are going to happen. I'm not going to be able to form a clotting factor. Another thing, I'm not going to be able to form bile. Bile is really important to increase the surface area of what? El fat. And essentially, I'm not, if I can't uh, absorb el fat, then I also can't absorb el vitamin K, and therefore, I'm putting myself in risk. Bye. <laughs> All right. And last thing is hemophilia. Hemophilia is hereditary as we know. Um, so mainly, which gender is affected? Males. Males are mainly affected by this. So this is an excellent genetic disease. We have three different types. The most common is going to be hem uh, hemophilus A or hemophilia A. The least severe is going to be the uh, hemophilia C. Both genders are equally likely to get it, even though it's X-linked. Um, but it's least severe for the reason that this factor over here, which is factor number 11, it's actually, its action is the same as action um, factor number 9. So both of them are going to, no wait, contributed by another factor 7, sorry, 
it is the least severe as the missing factor seven activates, sorry, it activates factor nine, which is which can also be activated. Is this nine? Yeah, nine, which can also be activated by factor number seven. So seven, both seven and both 11, seven and 11, both of them, they can produce or they can essentially activate factor number nine. And that's why it's the least severe. If we don't have this, there's another factor to basically take part. And that's just a quick review. Uh, so yeah, remember just A is going to be factor number eight, then hemophilia B nine. I'm gonna skip the 10 and I'm going to go to 11, okay? Which is hemophilia C. Okay, the last thing that we have disseminated intravascular uh, coagulation, which is basically both of them together. I'm going to have random clots in the body, but at the same time in um, intact blood vessels, I am going to um, have clots and then there could be uh, bleeding. So this could happen and this could happen, a combination of both. And that's it. Now look, uh, because...